tonight, gridlock in the city as thousands of Invasion Day activists make their voices heard. A group of neo-Nazis led by Thomas Sewell intercepted by police. Victoria's newer citizens take the oath as Melbournians celebrate living in the lucky country. Two pioneering cancer crusaders named Australians of the Year, inspired by a life or death battle. A mass thug launches a vicious attack on a mobile speed camera. And a rising Italian star pushes the Joker to the limit in a semi-final for the ages. This is Melbourne's Nine News with Alicia Loxley and Tom Steinfurt. Good evening. Tens of thousands of Invasion Day demonstrators have flooded the heart of Melbourne, demanding an end to Australia Day celebrations. City streets came to a standstill for almost five hours as the crowd chanted in anger and defiance. Laura Turner was there. On a day that can be divisive, they called themselves a mob united. Police estimating about 35,000 people joined in the rally cry of grievances. I'm marching for Aboriginal land rights in this land. I'm marching for land back and to end the colony. In celebrating genocide. We just got to educate those who who say, "Oh, it's it, just get over it." It's just well. No, we just come to celebrate our own sovereignty and, yeah, so that's sort of what it means to me. A sea of anger booing Victoria Police. No justice, no peace, no racist police! Young First Nations people leading the chanting. It's not a day to celebrate, it's Invasion Day, and I don't support that. In an outpouring of generational anger. Don't stand, put your hand up! Survival. This is the day that we started and this is the day to show that we are still here and continuing today. While these voices can be polarising in the wider community, every year they get louder. And today the demand goes far further than scrapping Australia Day. We need to stop black deaths in custody and Aboriginal people want land back now. Police didn't arrest anyone, but there was a conflict of beliefs. You wear your T-shirt that I can to. see. Yeah, that's OK. We're it's allowed offensive. to. We're I find it offensive. Face. Even with tourists. But if you've got an axe to grind, it's OK. But don't ruin it for everybody else. Demonstrators dominated city streets for almost five hours, emboldened by free Palestine protesters who joined in. We're definitely coming out here in support of our brothers and sisters, out um, in Palestine and Palestinians around the world, and particularly here. A movement gridlocking Melbourne's cultural landmarks in a demonstration of defiance. If we get the acknowledgement like um, Anzac Day, it, it, like, it'd be beautiful. Meantime, Sydney's Invasion Day rally was almost hijacked by a group of neo-Nazis. Laura Turner is in the newsroom with more on this one. Now, Laura, Thomas Sewell travelled from Melbourne to attend a counter-protest there. He did, Tom. Thomas Sewell is someone, a man notorious and well-known to Melburnians as a Nazi leader. We understand uh, that he led a group through a train station in Sydney today, through Ardman Station, as a group of about 60 men clad in black. You can see on screen there they had flags, they were chanting through that station and then actually boarded a train. But police intercepted them at uh, North Sydney Station and that is where they actually evacuated that train, got everyone else off, saying, there were safety concerns for the public. They questioned all of these men who were headed towards uh, the Australia Day protest in Sydney. So uh, there were fears there were going to be clashes there and police actually did make a couple of arrests as well, Tom. Laura Turner, thank you. Meanwhile, a prominent Indigenous leader has condemned the vandalism of St Kilda's Captain Cook statue, calling it an abhorrent crime. Boonwurrung Land and Sea Council Chair Jason Briggs says the desecration of the monument threatened to overshadow this morning's sacred smoking ceremony. Crowds gathered at dawn to reflect on the history of First Nations people and unite for a better future. We are of the view that they will not prevail. The, the goodwill will not be defeated by, by, by lowlifes who actually sought to, to, to bring down this event and um, they did not succeed. Security has been patrolling at Katani Gardens where the statue once stood and guards were also stationed at Cook's Cottage in Fitzroy Gardens. Families, meantime, have united at pubs and parks across Victoria celebrating a land of opportunity. Today will be remembered by many not as a public holiday but as the day they officially became Australian. Mark Santomartino met some of them. Laura Minetti was an English backpacker. Woo-hoo! 
<laughs> now she's married, six months pregnant and officially an Aussie. The uh, We Are Australia song hit hard. And I had a bit of tears, which I blame on the hormones. <laughs> <laughs> Laura's husband, Anthony, was in the crowd, packed inside Melbourne's town hall, supporting loved ones from India, Somalia, Palestine and beyond as they became Australian citizens. Oh, my God, I can't even explain the feeling. It's amazing. I'm happy. I'm very, very happy. The best thing I love about Australia is, like, uh, the respect for the multicultural society. I love everything about this country. I'm so proud to become an Australian citizen today. That pride beamed through his smiles, even on the face of Sally Cap. You are ready? upholding a tradition which other councils across the state have abandoned. I really welcome those debates and hope that we can change the date in due course. In Sydney, the faces of four First Nations heroes were projected onto the sails of the Opera House, marking a moment of mourning at dawn services across the country. We don't want to be angry, we don't want to put anyone off or polarise people, we just want people to feel like we're all coming together as humans. It's about peace, it's about unity and it's about healing. That message carried across the grounds of Government House, where Professor Margaret Gardner used her first Australia Day speech as Governor to paint a broader history. This nation was not set in stone on one day or in one document. Four flags were raised and a soldier fainted in front of an audience of educators and just one former Premier. For me, today is a reminder of that special Australian spirit of looking out for one another in the hardest of times. Even before the festivities finished, thousands of people were lining up outside Government House for a glimpse and a look inside. It's one of its only two open days for the year and they get free self-guided tours, entertainment and even the chance for a picnic on the fabled lawns. I bought a lot of merchandise. Some of it I bought from uh, Coles. Uh, obviously you weren't going to be able to buy from Woolworths. Could it be another day? Of course. Do we need Australia Day? Of course we do. That fact isn't lost on Jenny Marsh whose husband Russell has been decorating their Williamstown pub for 20 years. Fundamentally, we need to remember who we are and what we're here for. And for many, that can be as simple as a lamington and a Tim Tam on a day off with mates. This is the best country in the world. I mean, why change anything? It's great. Love it. Mark Santo Martino. Happy Australia! Nine News. Our newly minted Australians of the Year are already credited with saving thousands of lives, but their crusade is far from over. Professors Georgina Long and Richard Scolia are pioneering melanoma researchers. Now the latter is in a cancer fight of his own. Here's Sophie Upcroft. <laughs> Best friends and partners in medicine now sharing in the country's top honour. The 2024 Australian of the Year is Professor... Georgina Long and Professor Richard Scolia. Together saving thousands of lives with an immunotherapy treatment for melanoma, curing half of all patients diagnosed. Channel 9 cameraman Tim Sweeney, living proof of their success. But I did come in to say thank you. Oh. You did save my life. Yeah, wow. Because I'm going well. Yeah, yeah fantastic. Uh, Richard was diagnosed with brain cancer last year. The professor turned patient, the first in the world undergoing experimental therapy, using everything they know about melanoma on his brain, hoping it will help save others. Seemed like a, a no-brainer, if you like, to, to me. Let's give it a crack, see if we can make a difference in brain cancer too. Golden Girl Emma McKeon, our most decorated Olympian at 29, adding Young Australian of the Year to her collection for her charity work. I just really want to inspire Australians, particularly young Australians and kids, to go after their dreams. Indigenous elder Yalme Yunapingu winning the senior category, recognising her 40 years of teaching, using the power of language to unite our cultures. <laughs> They'd all stand, stand up and work together. A man from a tiny outback Queensland town with a huge vision, David Elliott crowned local hero. After stumbling on dinosaur bones in a paddock 25 years ago, he's spent every day since preserving our prehistoric history, keeping Winton on the map. I'm just going to keep doing what I do. And, and that sort of really embraces everything. So it embraces regional Australia, it embraces education with kids. Their first official duty, welcoming our newest citizens and in their new roles, they will meet and no doubt inspire millions more. In Canberra, Sophie Upcroft, Nine News.
An illustrious group of Victorians is among 700 people on this year's Australia Day honours list. Professor Brett Sutton, a polarising figure throughout the pandemic, has been recognised for his distinguished service to the community. Eliza Rugg has more. Loved and loathed in equal measure. This is certainly awful advice to have to give to any government. Professor Brett Sutton has been made an officer of the Order of Australia for leading Victoria's health response through COVID. I feel profoundly grateful to receive this honour, the former Cho said in a statement. To me, this is recognition of the extraordinary work of thousands in public health in Victoria. Also extraordinary, Holocaust survivor Peter Gasper on a mission to stop anti-Semitism. Today, unfortunately, more than ever, uh, because of the rise of hate. Honours too for world-leading burn specialist Dr Fiona Wood, a pioneer in her field, and county court judge Wendy Ann Wilmouth. In the sporting arena... Oh, and there's a big appeal there, so I think that she's got him. Zoe's got him. Zoe Goss has dedicated decades to women's cricket, long after bowling out one of the world's greatest batsmen, Brian Lara, and saluted for his contribution to music, maestro John Foreman. Carols by Candlelight and Logies over the years, and I've loved being involved in all of those things. A big thank you, too, to Victorian filmmaker David Perra. His iconic wildlife cinematography highlighting the impact of climate change. Penny Fowler, chair of the Herald and Weekly Times and the Good Friday Appeal, made the list for helping sick children. And although he's not with us anymore, Father Bob Maguire has made the grade for looking after who he called the unloved and the unlovely. I think he would have been fairly chuffed. For the second time since 1975, the majority of recipients in the general division of the honours list are women, and there is certainly one very special woman who has left her mark. 83-year-old Margaret Ann Hayes has jumped out of a plane twice as part of her mission to raise a quarter of a million dollars for charity. Every older lady volunteer, if you said to them, stop work at 11 o'clock, the country would fall to pieces, I think. Eliza Rugg, Nine News. Well, for the first time in 2,195 days, Novak Djokovic has tasted defeat at the Australian Open. The world number one beaten by Italian Yannick Sinner just moments ago in an epic semi-final on Rod Laver Arena. Of course, we will go to Tony Jones, who was lucky enough to watch it all unfold at Melbourne Park. Now, Tony, could this be a changing of the guard? Well, it is, Alicia, because uh, Novak Djokovic, of course, has been a 10-time champion here at Melbourne Park, never lost a semi-final, never lost a final, but now he finds himself packing his bags and heading home, and the uh, crowd you can see behind me there is just in a sense of disbelief. This was only about one or two minutes ago, the moment that that young man, Yannick Sinner, lived up to all expectation and finally made his way through to a final at a Grand Slam. So, look, it was an amazing match to watch unfold because... The first two sets, Sinner made Djokovic look like Djokovic has made his opponents over the years look. Uh, he was being run ragged around the place, but you never thought that Novak Djokovic would succumb in straight sets, and that wasn't to be, because in the third set, he dug deep and sort of came out with all his fighting qualities to actually take that, and you thought, well, OK, maybe we're going to see one of those epic five setters. It wasn't to be, because in the fourth set, Sinner was able to regroup, he regained his power, he regained his dominance, he regained his confidence and as a result of that he is now through to the final. So this really has been a remarkable afternoon here at Melbourne Park. Let's just relive match point. Look at that smile, it says it all, doesn't it? So, as I say, Yannick Sinner through to Sunday night's final here at the Australian Open. We'll be joined a little later on. I might actually make my way back inside Rod Laver Arena and be joined by Leighton Hewitt, who will just talk us through it. And also preview uh, tonight's match between Daniil Medvedev and, Medvedev and Alexander Zverev, because uh, he will face one of those two men. An extraordinary afternoon here at Melbourne Park. I'll be back, as I said, a little later on with the rest of today's sport, including the upset at the Gabba, because what is going on there in the <laughs> test between Australia and the Windies? As the great Bill Laurie would say, it's all happening. It is all happening. Upsets are plenty, Tony. We look forward to coming back to you later on. 
All right, a thug has used a hammer to smash up a speed camera car in Melbourne's northwest. Amber Johnston is in Sunbury tonight. Amber, police have released video of this attack. They have, Alicia. It's the latest in a spate of attacks against speed cameras and their operators. This one targeted by what appears to be a masked tradie. The whole ordeal was captured on CCTV in Wilson's Lane in Sunbury. In the vision, the vandal climbs on top of the car and starts jumping up and down. Next, he pulls out a spray can and graffitis the rear window. After that, he produces a hammer and tries to smash the car windows before cracking a headlight inside the whole time was a 43-year-old operator who would have been understandably terrified. Thankfully, he escaped unharmed as the thug fled towards Marjorie Avenue. Now, this happened last year on the 30th of November, but police need the public's help releasing that vision, hoping someone out there will recognise him. Hey, Amber, thank you. The opposition is vowing to target Anthony Albanese on trust and integrity until the next election. They've accused the Prime Minister of breaking a promise in favour of giving more low and middle income workers bigger tax cuts. National Affairs Editor Andrew Probin. Stepping up for a defining parliamentary fight. General Salou. Before freshly minted citizens, Anthony Albanese commending unity and a sense of common purpose. We are always at our best when we work together. Bipartisanship's already a fantasy when it comes to his plan to dump already legislated tax cuts for a Labor alternative. He lied. Uh, he and the Treasurer lied over a hundred times to Australians. Better for women and workforce participation, better for nurses and truckies and teachers and policemen and women. Labor's tax plan halves the benefit for the highest paid and gives more to low and middle income earners. More help with the cost of living for more Australians. On a day that always provokes questions about national identity, the opposition says it's the Prime Minister's character that's in query. Well, I think it's just a major break of trust. It's a betrayal. Most Australians don't want a Prime Minister who looks them in the eye, tells them one thing and then does completely the opposite. Prime Minister Anthony Albanese is changing plans to make sure we get better tax cuts for people. The PM's been challenged by Peter Dutton to put his tax plan to the people by calling an election. The tax cuts uh, will take place on July 1. The earliest election is August 2024. So... You work it out. Prime Minister, you say you've changed your tax plan to suit the times, but when does a broken promise become a fib? This isn't the easy decision. This is the right decision being done for the right reasons. But it's a decision that effectively triggers a contest over tax and trust from now until the nation next votes. Andrew Probin, Nine News. And when Nine News Melbourne returns, a registered nurse lost in the Phillip Island tragedy remembered for saving others. An 1850s church crumbles, triggering a massive search and rescue operation. And Powerball jackpots to 200 million. Chris Kohler reveals the odds of getting the winning ticket. Nine News, brought to you by Stan. One of the victims of the Phillip Island drowning tragedy was an aged care nurse and two of his late cousins wanted to follow in his footsteps. As Mimi Becker reports, police have ramped up their presence around waterways this weekend. To his family and friends, Shivam Anand was a registered nurse with a heart of gold. He saved many lives throughout his career but was unable to be saved when needed himself. The 23-year-old, one of four from the same family, killed when a change in the tide dragged them out to sea at Forest Caves on Phillip Island on Wednesday. Shivam's little sister Sahani and their 20-year-old cousin Kriti were both nursing students. Their aunt Rima was visiting from India, enjoying an Australian summer that sadly turned to tragedy. Friends writing online she will never return to her two children who are in India. Shocked family and friends have started a fundraiser. So far, more than $40,000 has been raised. It's been a tragic week on our waterways, um, so that's part of the reason we're out in force. Victoria Police has boosted patrols across the state to try to keep people safe. Swimmers, boaters and jet ski riders told to be aware of the conditions. It's been a busy summer. It's been a different summer in the sense that we haven't had that consistent hot 
hot weather. So far this summer, 19 people have drowned in Victoria's waterways. The Australia Day long weekend, one of the busiest at beaches, rivers and lakes across the state. We want people to enjoy our beautiful waterways in Victoria, but more importantly, go home safe at the end of the day. Mimi Becker, Nine News. The steeple of a church in the United States has collapsed into the rest of the building, taking out most of the roof and the entrance. There were fears people were inside, with search and rescue teams deployed, but there were no major injuries. The church in New London, Connecticut, was built in 1850. Japan's stricken moon lander has finally sent its first images back to Earth, helping to explain why it initially struggled to generate power. The snapshots reveal the craft had come to rest on its nose when it made its historic touchdown almost a week ago. The Powerball prize pool has now jackpotted to a record-breaking $200 million, with more than half of the Australian adult population expected to now have a ticket. But what are the chances of winning? Well, our finance editor Chris Kohler has the buzzkill information. Back in June, the jackpot hit $100 million. This week, it was $150 million. And next week, it'll be $200 million, a new Australian record. So how does the main prize keep rising so much? Well, it's been done on purpose, by making the game harder. Back in 2018, the odds of winning were 1 in 76 million. But an extra ball has since been added, and now it's 1 in 135 million. So much, much harder. But when you're already talking about a moonshot, people are still happy to have a crack. And the strategy has been paying off for the company behind the lottery. In the last 10 days, it's increased in value by $600 million. But just for context, our new record of $200 million is still dwarfed by the American lottery. A little over a year ago, there was a $2 billion jackpot and it was handed to a single winner, Edwin Castro. The odds of him winning that were one in almost $300 million, and his year-long spending spree shows no sign of abating. <laughs> All right, it is time to head back to Melbourne Park and check in with Madeline Spark. Matty, thankfully much drier there for semi-final day. That's right, it has been, Tom. Showers cleared overnight, just a sprinkle in eastern suburbs this morning, but it has been a bit cooler, a top of just 22 degrees in the city, so not exactly sparkling conditions for Australia Day barbecues, but terrific weather for tennis. And I'm joined by someone who's working with some of the tennis stars of the future, Paul Vassalo. You are the Director of Talent for Tennis Australia. Thanks for joining us. No, thanks. Pleasure to be here. Now, behind us, we have all of the kids on the Super Tens camp having so much fun here. What's that program about? Uh, so Super Tens is a national program that's run throughout each state um, so they play throughout the school term in teams of, uh, of kids under 10 uh, and as a, as a year-end activity we invite the better kids on, on behaviour and ability to be part of a national camp that's held throughout the week of the, of the second week of the AO. Amazing, so you've got 64 kids down here. 64 kids, 32 boys, 32 girls from all over the country, we, uh, they're staying in hotels with our team, they're doing coin tosses, they're playing on court, they're uh, going down watching matches on RLA, so it's a great week. Amazing, and even if they don't go on to be a tennis star as such, it is a great way to keep active and make some great friends. It is, hopefully from here there is lifelong friends where they're playing at their local club or hopefully travelling the world in 10 years' time and they'll, they'll get to be a part of that from, from 10 to maybe 50 years of age, who knows. Beautiful, thanks so much and best of luck to all the children behind me. Alicia and Tom will have the forecast for the rest of the long weekend later in the bulletin. Right, we'll come back to you shortly, Maddie. thank you. We're still to come in Nine News, caravan crash, five people hospitalised in the States north including two children. Drivers dodge a stricken plane as it makes an emergency landing on a highway. And simple tips to help parents and students get ready for the return to school. Nine News brought to you by Australia's number one selling vehicle Ford Ranger. Two children and three adults are in hospital after a truck collided with a ute towing a caravan in Victoria's north. The crash occurred in Benalla last night, the impact forcing the ute and caravan into trees. All five people in the car were injured, including the 72-year-old driver who was flown to hospital. The driver of the truck was not hurt. Donald Trump has taken the stand to defend himself against a writer who's seeking millions of dollars for defamation. His appearance was only brief, but the former president made the most of it, framing himself as the victim as he takes on the justice system. Jonathan Kersley reports from New York. Emerging from Trump Tower with a wave and a fist in the air before the former president took the stand in a trial to defend himself, 
It was only three minutes, and according to Donald Trump's lawyers... Alina, how did that go today? Fantastic. The defamation case was brought by writer E. Jean Carroll. Donald Trump has already been found liable for sexually abusing and defaming her. This trial is for remarks he made when he was president. In court, he watched his own deposition played to the jury. It's the most ridiculous, disgusting story. It was just made up. Do you stand by your testimony? In deposition, his lawyer asked him, 100% yes. Did you deny the allegation to defend yourself? Alina Hubber asked him. Yes, I did, Donald Trump replied. That's exactly right. She said something I considered a false accusation. But the judge ordered the jury disregard the last part, having set strict rules around what the former president could say. Outside, Donald Trump told reporters, this is not America. Today, E. Jean Carroll got to see Donald Trump take the stand. With his testimony now done, soon it will be over to a jury to determine how much in damages, if any, the former president will have to pay to E. Jean Carroll. She's seeking $15 million. How did you feel seeing him in the stand, E. Jean Carroll? Tonight, Donald Trump is again insisting he's been wronged, using his time in the stand to raise money. In New York, Jonathan Kersley, Nine News. The US state of Alabama has used nitrogen gas to execute a convicted murderer after he survived a lethal injection. Kenneth Smith was put on death row for his involvement in a 1988 murder, but the initial execution attempt failed in 2022. UN human rights experts tried to stop the gassing, saying the procedure was risky and could lead to a torturous death. It is not the first time the method has been used in the US. A terrifying sight for drivers in Turkey, a huge military plane skimming just metres overhead as it came in for an emergency landing. The country's defence ministry says a technical problem forced its pilots to land in a soccer field. As Victorian parents rush to buy last-minute uniforms and stationery, they're being encouraged to consider their child's mental health. Amid a surge in school refusal, experts have told Amber Johnston there are simple steps to help manage back-to-school anxiety. A new school year means new beginnings, new adventures and new challenges. This is where you'll learn to write. Five-year-old Harley seemingly unfazed as he prepares for his first day of prep. So he came home with his uniform when we bought it and I was getting a little bit emotional. He's like, why are you crying? A new survey found it's not just parents who are struggling. Psychologists at Smiling Mind found half have noticed a decline in their child's mental health in the past year. And the same number don't feel prepared to manage and support their kids' struggles. I do know that at the moment about 70% of paediatric appointments in Australia are for mental health concerns. Experts partially blaming the COVID hangover and a spike in generalised anxiety among students, with many refusing to go to school last year. Getting ready for a new school year can feel extra daunting. To make the transition back to school a little easier, experts say it starts at home with tools such as the Smiling Mind app, helping parents navigate some of those tough emotions. Other tips include preparing ahead of time to avoid rushing in the morning, resetting routines such as bedtime before school starts and encouraging your child to talk about their feelings. It's probably just that uncertainty, just the unknown. I think that's pretty normal for anybody and, you know, I'm sure he's feeling it just like I'm feeling it. Amber Johnston, Nine News. Still ahead in the news, the consumer watchdog backs Virgin over Qantas to run extra flights to Bali. Plus, we tour the Athletes' Village in Paris with Olympic chef de mission Anna Mears. The consumer watchdog is supporting Virgin's application for more flights to Bali. Both Qantas and Virgin want to add almost 2,500 seats every week under a new agreement between Australia and Indonesia. The ACCC says it would increase competition and drive prices down if Virgin's application was successful. 14,000 athletes will head to Paris for the Olympics and their home away from home is almost ready. As Edward Godfrey discovered, sporting stars will get all the creature comforts as they prepare to chase gold. 
A sneak peek inside the home of the 2024 Games. In Saint-Denis, on the outskirts of Paris, there's a race on to finish the athletes' village. This is a city within a city, so we have to provide athletes with all the amenities, everything that they need during the Games. Paris 2024 organisers say it would normally take 15 years to construct something this big. It'll be done in under five. 40 new buildings, 3,000 apartments, each with multiple rooms, spanning 300,000 square metres. From July, it'll house 14,000 athletes. Our chef de mission, Anamir, is inspecting the site, along with Australian representatives for each sport. Very positive. Um, good quality, good to be able to see it early ahead of the Games time so that they can provide feedback back to the sports and athletes as well. It's accessible, eco-focused and naturally cooled, although the Aussie team has specifically requested air conditioning. There will be 9,000 trees and even outdoor air purifiers. Recycled materials keep the cost of the village down around 3.3 billion Australian dollars. It has the necessities and some luxuries. There'll be a bank, a post, uh, there'll be a merchandise store, a grocery store, an air salon or so, and uh, a big screen or so, so they can look at the games here together. Everything here has been built quite close together so that the athletes don't have too far to walk anywhere. But they'll also have access to shuttles and chauffeured golf carts to help them get around the village. The apartments will eventually be sold and rented for private use, but not before they've been called home by current and future champions. Very happy to host uh, Australians athletes here in the village and uh, to live the game with them. In Paris, Edward Godfrey, Nine News. All right, time to head back to Tony Jones at Melbourne Park. And TJ, what a huge day it has been there. Absolutely mammoth, Tommy, I've got to say, and uh, everyone's still just catching their breath. We'll be joined by Leighton Hewitt after the break just to unpack the drama that unfolded here. That drama, all because of this 22-year-old Italian who has sent Novak home without silverware for the first time in six years. Also coming up in sport, a shiver sent down the spine of every Pies fan as a favourite goes head first into the ground. Plus, more questions surrounding Steve Smith at the top order. Welcome back to Melbourne Park. It might be Australia Day, but the day has belonged so far to a young Italian by the name of Yannick Sinner. He has done the unthinkable, it would seem, in dethroning the king of Melbourne Park, Novak Djokovic. It happened over four dramatic sets. The first two quite comfortably went the way of Sinner. Then in the third, Novak Djokovic gave notice that he wasn't finished with yet. But in the fourth, it was Sinner who dug deep and nothing was going to deny him an opportunity to figure in his first Grand Slam final. Joshua Dorr with the highlights. His name might be written on the walls, but when Novak Djokovic steps onto Rod Laver Arena, there's only one idol. This time, though, it was the semi-final debutante off to a flyer. What a start. Yannick Sinner taking full advantage of the Serbian sloppiness. The first set his in just 35 minutes. And as the 22-year-old's confidence swelled with each powerful winner... Novak's radar faded further. It's another break. Sinner starting strong in the second. He located some brilliance for a much-needed spark. Oh, my goodness. What a save. But those moments would be only fleeting. Sinner smashing the semi-final. He takes the second set. The Joker's army couldn't believe its eyes. Sinner was reading their man like a book. Oh, yes. With Djokovic's dream of a 25th crown unravelling at the seams, survival instincts kicked in. Amazing. The third set on a knife's edge until a medical emergency in the stands halted play for six minutes. And rising from that break, the 10-time champion, saving a match point in the tie-break, now limbered up and ready to go the distance. It's Djokovic on the breaker. We're going for but that took a physical toll on Djokovic, escaping for another breather as the sun continued to bear down. And the fourth seed welcomed him back with more heat. And this time he breaks. The gutsy Italian refusing to take his foot off the pedal, with even Novak joining in the applause. Sinner, now the saint of Melbourne Park. There's a new kick. Into his first Grand Slam final, the smile finally crept across his face. I lost um, last year in, in the semis in Wimbledon, so I, I think I, I learned a lot from that. And, you know, it's, it's all part of the process. I'm really happy to share this here with you guys and, and also with my team. As the world number one exited his court, defeated, 
for the first time since 2018. Joshua Dorr, Nine News. OK, Leighton Hewitt joins us live now. Leighton, are you shocked? Uh, not entirely, to be honest. I saw up close in the Davis Cup final last year mm. how good Yannick Sinner was. And in my opinion, coming in this, this tournament this time round, I thought he was the best player in the world. But it was whether he could do it over five sets and had that That's inner right. belief to be able to go the distance with the very best here at Melbourne Park. He proved that today and, uh, you know, worthy to be through to his first Grand Slam final. I suppose in the case of Novak, you know, some of the commentary will be, is this the end of the era? Is it? Uh, I don't think so. Yeah, he'll come back hungrier again, I think, especially at the next few Grand Slams. The French Open will be the next one on his target. But for Yannick Sinner now, you know, what a massive opportunity he gets on Sunday. We, we've looked at this guy for a number of years now and thought he's very close to holding up his first major trophy, and, and he gets that shot at it. And he sits back tonight and watches the other two blokes fight it out. How do you see that going? It's going to be a tough match. Not sure which way this is going to go. Medvedev against Zarev. Zarev's put in the miles, though, throughout. He's had some really tough five-set matches that he's had to fight his way through. Uh, Medvedev, he's been on this stage before. Well, I don't know how his mindset will be. Obviously, he lost to Novak before in a final. So let's see what happens. Should be a beauty. All right, and you'll be there in the commentary box for nine. Yeah, looking forward to it. Well, good work, Leighton. Cheers, mate. Good on you, mate. Leighton Hewitt joining us live there. Now to some footy news. And, uh, well, Collingwood fans, Nathan Murphy has survived yet another concussion scare, being driven head first into the ground at training today. But that wasn't the only piece of drama, because as Xander Maguire tells us, uh, a couple of the other stars, there was some friendly fire involved there. Nathan Murphy has had 10 concussions and nearly had his career ended by an expert panel in December. So this was the last thing Pies fans wanted to see. Murphy taken off the track for around 15 minutes before thankfully finishing match simulation with no concern. He wasn't the only magpie that was in the wars either. Another playful spat between Jordan Degoe and Nick Dacos. Perhaps the fire needed to ignite Collingwood's premiership defence. Watching those two get in, I think, in our environment, highly competitive players is what you want. They push each other. They're arguably our two most important players, so when they're going at it, um, it's good to see. Jeremy Howe now training without the sleeve, which masked his shattered arm last year and ready to embrace more positional versatility in the twilight of his career. I'm playing a little bit down forward at the moment, but uh, don't expect to see me down there. Um, yeah, my primary role will be down back again. And uh, if they need me to kick a couple of goals, I'm more than happy to chuck my hand up. Josh Dacos again trained away from the main group with a foot issue as former Pine Mark Keane visited his old teammates. Head recruiter Derek Hine also watched from afar, surveying a number of uncontracted players vying for one of Collingwood's three vacant list spots. At Melbourne, Angus Brayshaw joined match simulation for a quarter, baby steps towards a concussion recovery. Jake Lever returned from an ankle issue, while Christian Salem was restricted to running laps due to a hamstring concern. Xander Maguire, Nine News. Now to the cricket, and there's big question marks again over Steve Smith's position at the top order after he again struggled with the new ball. Now, all this happened on day two of the second test at the Gabba between Australia and the West Indies. How's this for a scoreline? The Windies actually made 311. The Australians, a short time ago, 5 for 93. Can you believe that? Here's Nat Unides. The early signs were ominous. This wouldn't be Australia's day. Yes, no, Green rarely has any issues in the gully. An untimely run out, the only slip up for the West Indies. Oh, run out, oh, no. gotta be out, gotta be out. That is a monumental muck up. Kevin Sinclair's half century helped his side surpass 300 for the first time this summer. That's a beauty, and not only that, it's 50 on debut for Sinclair. The Windies all out for a respectable 311, putting more pressure on new opener Steve Smith. Oh, did you get it inside there, Johnny? The umpire forced to reverse his call and Smith was gone for six. Marnus Labashain wasn't far behind. Edged away, great catch! That is a screamer! Cam Green couldn't crack double digits. Oh, is that out? It is! He hits it straight to middle! as it all came to a head for the Aussies. Oh, there was a noise. Oh, he's given him! Caught behind down the leg side. Travis had his form. Two wickets in two balls for Kumar Roach. Had Australia in trouble at four for 24. Usman Kawaja quickly running out of partners. Brilliant bowling. Great thinking from the West Indies. And Marsh's fight is over pretty quick as well. Nat Unides, Nine News.
OK, that wraps it up from Centre Court here at Rod Laver Arena. But it promises to be a terrific semi-final with the men tonight. And it's still, everyone's still catching their breath, I've got to say, after Novak Djokovic's uh, not so much a surprise exit, but certainly an exit. Anyway, uh, I'm about to get drowned out by Dragon. They're belting out rain, <laughs> which is probably a nice segue for Lavinia, I would have thought. <laughs> Thank you very much, Tony. It is Madeline Spark. We will find, though, at Melbourne Park tonight for another check on the weather. Maddie, how's the rest of the long weekend looking? Well, Alicia, it will improve a little each day, but unfortunately the weather is saving the best for Monday. We have those details and the seven-day forecast next. Hello again from Melbourne Park. It's been a much better day for players and fans with yesterday's showers clearing overnight and cloud continuing to break up through the afternoon. It couldn't get the temperature moving though. The city only made it to 22 degrees. Geelong did a bit better though with a top of 25. Essendon and Werribee also warmed up to 25 this afternoon. Most suburbs maxed out at 22 or 23, just 19 at Fernie Creek. Showers have been confined to southern districts, mostly through west and south Gippsland, but nothing more than a few millimetres. The southwesterly winds have been quite fresh along the coast and 24 at sail has been the highest maximum through the south. Northern districts didn't do much better, with most spots peaking at 25 or 26. Last night, tropical cyclone Kiralee reached the Queensland coast at Townsville, but it was quickly downgraded to a tropical low. The strong winds caused tens of thousands of homes to lose power, but the biggest risk from the system will be flooding set to unfold over the coming days. For us, a cold front is moving across Tasmania and that will continue the southwesterly wind flow for Victoria across the weekend. But winds will shift to warmer northerlies on Monday and that's set to be our hottest day of the week. Tomorrow, Brisbane is forecast to be our hottest capital city, heading for 36 degrees with showers developing at night. It'll be a warm day in Perth as well, 33 degrees, just 23 in Adelaide, 21 in Hobart with an afternoon shower, 27 in Canberra. Sydney had a scorcher today, 39 degrees, but cooler tomorrow, cloudy and 26. It'll be a mild day across Victoria with maximums of 22 and 23 through the south. And once again, the southwesterly winds will be quite fresh along the coast. There'll be sunny skies in the north with most spots heading for the mid to high 20s and parts of the Mallee are expected to warm up into the low 30s. It'll be quite a cool night across Melbourne, but minimums should come around dawn. For tonight's semi-final here at Melbourne Park, it should only drop to 18 by 9pm, 16 by midnight. Most suburbs are heading down to 11 or 12. Single figures at Fernie Creek, just 8 degrees, ahead of a top of 19 tomorrow. Elsewhere, it should reach 23 or 24. After a low of 12, Geelong's heading for a partly cloudy top of 24. And after dipping to 13, the city should do slightly better than today with a top of 23. 24 degrees on Sunday and it will feel even nicer under light breezes. Sunny skies and northerly winds will give the temperature a boost on Monday, 29. And then we'll get a weak cool change. Some cloudy skies on Tuesday, 24. 22 on Wednesday, 23 on Thursday, up to 26 next Friday with not a drop of rain forecast for the city all week. Now, it's been a huge day here with the first men's semi-final done and dusted and we've got a lovely, crisp Melbourne evening for the second. Alicia and Tom. Lots of action to enjoy there. Maddie, thank you very much for that. And that is Nine News this Friday. Thanks for being with us. Tennis is up next from the team here. We hope you have a wonderful long weekend. For now, good night.